We stay in the troubled Boko area in the Upper East region where women who are no longer able to bear the brunt of the protracted conflict in the area took to the streets earlier today to protest, asking government to do more to end the violence. Plus, the latest coming through right now is that there's been a secular from the courts. In fact, the courts in the area have been shut over safety concerns. That's the latest coming through the Boko situation right now. I'm going to tell you all of that. Stay with us here, um, here on Ghana Tonight. But we're also live on 3FM 92.7 tonight. Let's hear from the women in Boko earlier today who hit the streets calling on authorities to be quick in their response to ending hostilities resulting from the resurgence of the conflict. Take a look. It's very bad. And the killing been do uh, wale wale. It's very bad. As far as they are, as far as they are imposing yeah. curfew in Boku, they should be curfew in what in wale wale. Abagala is here with the help of the government, but they are saying it's from the local government who has brought him inside. So we don't know what is happening in Boku again. And, and they didn't mince words on that. Those were the, the women there wailing and asking for urgent steps to be taken to swiftly deal with the situation in Boko. And we, there's been a number of things that's happened over there. Just a few, there's uh, a chronology of events over the period, at least right from the beginning of this year, that specifically the 17th of January, uh, some gunmen attacked the tricycle operators near Boko Community Center. Some two persons were recorded and pronounced dead. A number of persons also sustained some injuries as a result of that. The next day, three persons were killed with reports suggesting that there are some military persons in uh, Sabongari uh, during a security operation following renewed fighting. And in January, same month, the 19th, the next day. So take note of these first three days in, in the year, 17th, 18th, 19th January, a bus carrying students, if you recall, was attacked near Binduri, uh, causing injuries, which was now related to some ethnic tensions in the area. A number of the students who were on that bus also s sustained some several degrees of injury. March 16, 2022, one person killed, three soldiers were injured in the gunfight. And you can also look at right from December 2022, we saw those renewed clashes as well. In fact, in this month, what we are seeing right now, gunmen blocked Bogatanga Tamale Highway, opened fire on travelers. Eight persons were reported dead. This was just two days ago. And on the 26th of October, exchange of gunfire due to the return of a rival chief in the area. According to what we are hearing right now, based on the reports from the Minister for Chieftaincy and Religious Affairs, Stephen Asamoabati himself, they put the death toll based on government's own records to 16. And we understand that, that that number could be more. More people may have died as a result of it, but the official figures from the ministry's perspective and account, 16 people. But earlier today, the minister addressed the press as well on this matter, plus that indication we're getting as well, or two four say to the second, has been called upon by government to lead a mediation process to tackle this matter in Boko. This is what Stephen Asamobatin said earlier today. Minister responsible for chieftaincy matters and with the government must be maintained. Government is guided by its responsibility to protect lives and property and above all to enforce law and order to restore normalcy as quickly as possible.
Well, so that's General Sivin and Samoa Boateng. Then we're going to be hearing more from him as we go on. Um, we're also live on 3FM 92.7. Now, before we came on air tonight, we got information from the courts. Another development, apart from the businesses that are shutting down in Boko and, and leaving the place, and in fact, a number of businesses have vacated the area over the years because of this unstable security situation over there. And that's also impacted on the economic situation and the life of the people there. Apart from that, and the people who are fleeing the area as a result of this renewed clashes, the courts have had to take a decision in the interest of the lives of the employees of the judiciary in there. This is it that we got just before we came on air. The attention of the Honorable Lady Chief Justice has been drawn to concerns expressed by lawyers and other stakeholders about the current situation in Boko and its environs. They say, in order to ensure the safety and security of the judges, staff, lawyers, and court users, the Honorable Lady Chief Justice has ordered the closure of the following courts with immediate effect until further notice. One, the High Court Bogatanga, Second Court Bogatanga, Second Court, that's the District Court as well, and the District Court in Zwarungu, District Court in Zebela, District Court in Garu, and the District Court in Bongo. And the registrars are to keep all assets of the courts in proper custody, and all staff are to stay safe. And please accept the compliments of the Honorable Lady Chief Justice. That's the information coming through right now. And so all of these courts have been closed as a result of the, the situation in Boko. Uh, right now, and, and that's troubling to say the least. And and the people who have been watching quite closely how things are playing out there, uh, we're going to be connecting with uh, one man who has uh, n n been not just a member of parliament, one of the longest serving MPs in Ghana, been part of a number of parliaments. He's still also a member of this eighth parliament, specifically the member of parliament for the Zebela constituency. Honorable Kletus Avokal is also an opinion leader in the area. He's joining us on Zoom right now. Uh, Honorable Kletus Avokal, thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, if you can unmute for me, if you can unmute for me, that, that, that will be good. Hello? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Great. Now, uh, with the developments right now, as we're seeing, and, and you've seen the women there, and you're watching me right now, the women who are wailing and asking for intervention, the courts have been closed down as a result of this renewed clashes. As a member of parliament, opinion leader in the area, this certainly must be giving you sleepless nights, is it not? No doubt, uh, Alfred. Very, very unfortunate development that we have in the area. But it is not today's development. It has been there for the past four years. Uh, it has uh, just reenacted uh, some few days ago, and then uh, it is even ex uh, escalating. And that is why the courts in Bolga, Navru, I mean, Bolga, Tanga, Bongo, etc., have been closed. Heated to those courts were working, except the court in Boku that had been closed. But it, it's a, it's, it, it's a demonst it demonstrates clearly that uh, there's more to it than uh, we, 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 we have in the Athens. And you talk about more to it than what we are seeing right now. We've seen the evolution of this conflict over time. It's not just chieftaincy anymore, is it not? Because we've seen the political side of it and now the, the criminal side of it as well, where politically over time, if the NPP is in power, the Mamprushis feel empowered. If the NDC is in power, the Kusashis also feel empowered. That, that's a reality, isn't it? Well... Uh, to a large extent, yes. The challenge we have is that people or government of the day does not want to address the truth, the truth of the matter, does not want to, uh, I mean, uh, resolve this matter. It is, there's no chieftaincy dispute pending in Boko. There's no chieftaincy dispute pending in any court or any, any, any administrative body in Boko or Ghana, for that matter. The Boko chieftaincy matter has been resolved by the various courts of competent jurisdiction. The last one was the Supreme Court of Ghana in 2003, where the Mampuses filed a writ in the Supreme Court challenging the Karen Bokunaba 
asking the Supreme Court to make a declaration that the Kusasi man cannot be Bokunawa except a man Prince, Prince, and that the uh, PNDC law 75 of 1983 should be declared null and void, etc., etc. Then a day to the hearing of the case, the man Prince threw in the towel. Their lawyers filed a, a notice of discontinuance of their action in the Supreme Court. But when the case was called and then the, all the parties were in court in 2003, I was there personally. The, the Supreme Court judges, presided by Justice, late Justice Aqua, may he so rest in perfect peace, asked them why they were withdrawing their case with notice we were liberty to come back. And uh, they said that they, they, when they read the Bokunaves defense, they, they had no legs to stand. That means they didn't have a good case. And the court sees with the facts and the law because this case was resolved in 1958 by the then Court of Appeal. That was the highest court of the land in favor of the Kusasis. Decree 112 of 1966 distilled the Kusasi chiefs. PNDC law 75 of 1983 restored the Kusasi chiefs, that's the Kerem Bokunaba, to the Court of Appeal status of, 1980, of 1958. Then the Supreme Court nailed the matter told the, the man priests that they have no case at all, that have regard to the, uh, the, 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 the evidence that we have exhibited mm. in our statement of defense. There was okay. no case before the court. And therefore, they had no right. The Supreme Court ruled that they had no right to come under any court in Ghana and challenge the Karen Bokunaba about the Boko chief dancing. The Supreme Court ruled in 2003, and that was during the era of President Kufo. That was but, the time that the man priests went to Kufo and told him that they were MPP, they had support him to come to power, and therefore he should seize the chieftaincy from the Kusasis for them. Well, but, and Kufo uh, told him that under the constitution, they could not do any such thing. But taking into consideration how things are playing out right now, one of the recommendations and the routes that government is considering to intervene in these latest clashes, which has claimed over 16 lives, is to have a 2 4 say to the second lead some mediation effort in the area. You are an opinion leader there. How much of a difference will this make? Oh, but uh, this is not, uh, it's not a new matter. About uh, a year or two years ago, the, 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 the government of the day had repaired the marriage pay or uh, I had appeared with the Bokunaba before the Tumfo to present the Kusasi side of the story. I had been there with my very good friend and brother, Honorable Mama Ayaraga, to meet the Otunfo on this matter. And uh, the uh, Otun Four seemed to have hit the wall because he told the Nairi that uh, the enskinment of uh, Sedu Abakri was illegal and that the Nairi should go and denounce the enskinment and then he would meet the Nairi and Bokunaba on an even floor, uh, even, uh, on a level playing field and then resolve the matter, see how they can resolve the matter. And that if Abakri remained in Nairobi as a chief, uh, the Asante Hindi said that, Otun Four said that, in fact, he didn't think that it was fair to the Bokunaba. To be for him to be handling a matter with a commoner. The Nairi rejected that, that offer or advice from the Asante Hini, and therefore the matter became stalled. I see. But so, so, so there's, not, not, uh, there's nothing to refer to anybody as at now. But the fact is that, uh, as I indicated, Alfred, there's no chieftaincy dispute pending in Boko. The Kusasis are there, the Boko number is there through due process, through rule of law. Well, but no what is happening now is, is um, I call it um, uh, yeah, what it, uh, banditry, criminality, and lack of respect for the rule of law and but, due process. But, but there's, one, the, there's one thing that the there's one thing that uh, Mr. Walker, there's one thing that we, uh, we take into consideration. In fact, and it stands out quite clearly. Yesterday, when the uh, statement came through from government, and for that matter, national security, for that matter, after that, that meeting of the security heads in this country, chaired by the president himself, there was a clear yeah. identification of the fact that the presence of uh, the said Seydou Abagri is, is an issue, and in fact, yeah. um, will continue to be a problem. That's stated in, the, in that particular true. statement that was released. But what was That's missing right. is that there was no recommendation to deal with the problem in that statement as to whether he was going to be removed there from, from that area or, or not. What, what are you expecting, finally, before we go? That is the challenge that we have. The government uh, said so, and I was very happy with, that they, with the fact that they have diagnosed the matter. They said that the, the, the violence in Boko today is occasioned by the illegal president of Abagri posing as a Boko Naba. 
the government has made that uh, finding of fact. And I was very pleased with that finding of fact. So what is the way forward? The way forward is to make sure that uh, publicly, Abagre's uh, situation is denounced as a chief right from the Nairis level to Boko level, or they remove Abagre from Boko to have peace in the area. And I think that the government must be working on uh, some of these scenarios. I cannot tell them the best way to do it. I think that they have enough uh, intelligence, they have enough security, they have enough experience to be able to resolve this matter while they have identified the, the issue, the cause of the, of, the, of the conflict. It is not enough to vary the curfew. The people of Boko have suffered for far too long for the past four years under the administration of the MPP. They've suffered for too long. People talk about, don't talk politics, don't do that. Nobody talk about politics. But there's a government of the day that the people had voted for. And the government has taken an oath to defend the constitution and to defend every Ghanaian, but, but, their lives and their properties. But, but so, let me ask so, you this. As you concede that uh, th this matter has also taken a political nature, you concede earlier that when, when the MPP is in power, one faction feels empowered. When the NDC is in power, one faction feels empowered. As, as a respected opinion leader in the area, are you going to be willing to join forces with the government approach to bring lasting peace in, in Boko? I, I have said that several times, uh, several years ago, that there's no, there's no use in fighting. In fact, um, our people have a saying that if a dog has a bone in the mouth, then that dog does need to back for the bone to drop so that another dog might come and pick it and then you can start chasing the rest of them. The Kusasis have nothing to fight for. They have, no, not, they have nothing to fight for. The Boko Nava is the chief. So he wants peace of the area so he can benefit from the fruits of his labor. We are talking about politics because there is a political government in, in office that is supposed to protect Ghanaians, their right. property and their lives. That is supposed to ensure that there is due process and the rule of law in the country. This is what we are saying. And that is not political. That is, that is administrative, and that is, that, is, that is what we should be doing. The government must be doing. Must right. be protecting innocent people. Must be protecting people's rights. Okay. That is, so if somebody is saying that the government is reneging on, on its duties, the government is uh, I mean, treating, treating Syria Bank with kid gloves, I mean, look at one person, one person alone, for four years, Boko has okay. been under curfew for four years. Nobody rides a motorcycle in Boko town, Teachers, workers, nurses, everybody, they can't ride a motor and go to work. Farmers cannot do business and go to work with a motor. Everybody. Boko, the people of Boko, the Kusasi people, they can't ride, uh, uh, what do you call, wear a smoke because they suspect that somebody uh, might become uh, carrying a weapon and, in the smoke. And, and, and All that's these the, and that's the, years. That, and that's the and reason that's why. Curfew, curfew cannot be used to solve a problem. Curfew is just a temporary measure. To, well, to contain the situation and escalate the situation so that we now look at how you can resolve the matter. For four years, curfew. Well, that's the reason so why the women... What, so what is the government doing? Well, Are they being responsive? Well, Avocat, appreciate your time on this matter, and that's you why got, the women... You are sacrificing yes, several the, lives the, the, because the, of the, the interests the, of one the person. The women were quite clear in their words and their, their yes. message to you and many others who are watching right now. Thank you for this. And then also that, that expression of commitment to partner whatever process to bring lasting peace in Boko. And I appreciate that. Thank you so much for joining us on this matter. As a member of parliament for the Zebela constituency, uh, the Honorable Kletus Avoka, and he is one of the longest seven MPs that we have in this country at the moment, being a, in part of a number of all these parliaments right from uh, the inception of this fourth republic, except for one. Uh, data has contributed to the, speed to the development of this country in many ways. But coming up next here on Ghana tonight, this is your election command center. The Electoral Commission of Ghana suspends printing of ballot papers for the Ghana Freedom Party that secured on course GFP to nominate a new candidate following the death of their flag bearer. That's the latest coming through right now. And this is coming in. It's a developing story fresh on the plate here on your election command center coming through from the Electoral Commission. This is your Election Command Centre. Well, the Electoral Commission has suspended printing of ballot papers for the presidential election slated for December 7. Now, this follows the death of the founder of the Ghana Freedom Party, Madame Ekia Donko. Uh, the Electoral Commission issued a statement. We have details of it. Dennis Poberi, Wadam Esquire is here. It's good to have you. Hey, Alfred. What's the EC saying? So... 
We have been waiting for this information from the EC as to what the next line of action is going to be uh, regarding the death of Equia Donko. Now the statement is here, and it's very clear on what the next line of action is going to be. Mm. The statement clearly states that the Electoral Commission received the news of the demise of Madame Equia Donko. They continue to say that while the 1992 Constitution and the Public Elections Regulations 2020 CI 127 are not clear on the processes to follow in the event of the death of a presidential candidate, Article 50, 54 of the 1992 Constitution provides as follows. They go on to quote except of that particular article, which I'll show you mm. the entirety of it. But then it also continues to say that the commission has since informed GFP to make arrangements to nominate a new candidate and inform the commission accordingly. So this was a statement that came in. And in the meantime, the commission has suspended the printing of the presidential ballot papers, which was near completion. See. Near completion. Near They've completion. not told us how many of them have been printed. We don't know the fate of those that have been printed already, but that is a conversation for another day. So Samotete signed this? Yes, Samotete signed this. I, I, I see. And, and, and it's, it's a big one that I know you're going to get into as we go on as well. Because yeah. if the statement is anything to go by that they, they had almost finished, finished printing, printing the, ballot, the papers. ballot papers, and then this has happened, happened. it essentially means they're going to discard all those ones they've printed. That's a logical inference to make. And then they would wait for wait whoever for becomes candidates. the GFP's new candidate and exactly. start their printing all over again. All over. At whose cost? Well, obviously, it democracy comes at the cost is expensive. To us. Eh? Very expensive. And they're they entitled to it because the law allows them. And this is not just mean um, any law, but it's the constitution that says so. So mm. they made reference to Article 50, 54 of the 1992 constitution. This is what the provision says that where at the close of nominations, but before the election, one of the candidates dies. A further period of 10 days shall be allowed for nominations and where the death occurs at any time within 25 days before the election, the election in that constituency or units shall be postponed for 21 days. Um, so the provision, this comes from the PNDC um, law 284, which had to do with parliamentary election. Right. But there's a similar provision that is contained in the constitution based on which in that one it doesn't specify whether it has to be constituency elections or national or, election. Or national elections. And that's why the, the the electoral commission says that they are going what is provided for in the constitution. They rather rely on this yes. than the CI. So with the CI. Because in the CI you would find that they talk about constituency. This is a national election we're talking about, Absolutely. a presidential election and that. So that essentially is what the electoral commission is going to do with respect to that. But of mm. course they are already um, some matters arising. We have seen some concerns from the camp of the NDC as to what likely would happen in the event that, for instance, if the GFP does not file a candidate. Now, what it means is that, mind you, mm -hmm. don't call is position number three on the ballot paper. Yes. What it means is that if they do not, they do not file a candidate, this number three will be empty. So what, 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 what would be the most probable uh, situation or option? So what we have seen, the NDC insinuates, and this is coming from the Director of Elections and IT, he's made a post a while ago, to say that they reject what they call automatic rearrangements. What it means is that there's the likelihood that the EC would suggest that if they do not file a candidate, this number three, somehow, somewhere should be filled up. I and see. if it has to be filled up, it means that it will affect the, and the various the, yes, numbers, the numbers below the three. Exactly. And those who are below the three, NDC know they are number eight, they likely may be affected. So even though the post is not clear yet, but when you look at it and you look at the line of activities that are coming up, you have that suspicion that that is what they have already said notice that when it gets to that point. <laughs> but of course, um, we have heard from the GFP, they say they're going to hold a meeting to decide on the way forward. They have not indicated whether or not they will not file a candidate, mm. but the Electoral Commission per the law but her has is given there, them the opportunity. Roman father also. Yes. Yeah. But I mean, it's not as of right for him to ascend to this place yet. Mm. That's why they have to meet to decide as a party right. as to whether he becomes the running mate of the party or not. And if at all, they would even want to contest. partake in this election. But let's see, 2020, when they contested the election, I mean, they, they got a very comfortable place. Out of 12 candidates, they were placed. Fifth, 
with a total Absolutely. vote of 5,330. That's some 0.04 percent. That's significant. And, and you know, you cannot discount the Kyodong Coast influence and impact, especially in the rural communities, as because of her appeal. Yeah. And, uh, you know, being one, a farmer had, had her own way of communicating to the people and then had to reach communities as well. Exactly. So you can understand why and she I think she comes to the table with her own uniqueness. It's the reason that, I mean, a good number of people like her for who she is. True. And when it comes to political conversations, there are people who particularly look out for her. And mm -hmm. for her to be out of the contest now, I mean, if you ask me, her legacy must continue. So mm. definitely, so somebody should be that somebody, somebody would, would, should be in that position up. for her. Like and to think that she's also the the founder of the party, I mean, the party should stand. And essentially, more of the bank roller of the party. Yes, that's what we know. She finances the party's you know activities. So uh, essentially, that's what the EC is doing. But the conversation now is about the ballot papers that have been printed already, the cost involved. What happens? What happens? Yeah. I wanted to flip to the, to the, to the next one. You talked about the constitutional provision um, and, and what the Article 54. Yes. And th just a quick one on this, because mm -hmm. this is, there, there are timelines to what has to happen next. Well, I see 10 days there. Yes. Right? And then for 25 nomination. days. So if you could just run through that again for us and break it down. Where at the close of nomination, but before election. Mind you, nominations have closed already. Nominations have closed already, and we are at a period that is before the election. Right. And that when one of the candidates dies, yes, that has been confirmed, that Equia Donko is no more, a further 10-day period shall be allowed for nominations. So it means that if the party is notified today, they have 10 days to nominate a new candidate to fill that space. Mm -hmm. Now, where the death occurs at any time within 25 days before election, mm -hmm. we're not even concerned with this because we what we're having to deal with satisfies the first part of it. Right. So our uh, fact squarely will deal with the first half of it. But okay. if it had happened where the death had occurred any time within 25 days before election, then in that case, we would have the election postponed for 21 days. But we are not there yet. We just mm. stick to the topmost part of it. So mm. that's uh, it. There's that's also part that talks about where if the candidate had died on the eve of the election, mm -hmm. but like I mentioned, when you come to the CI, Regulation 13.4 and then Regulation 17 there about, they talk about matters that have to do with parliamentary election. Right. And that's just to draw the distinction. But sticking to the constitution, which is generic, what we have here is what would apply. That 10 days for them to do the nomination, and then that's what we are having to deal with now. So, so GFP, you have to replace Equia Donko in the next 10 days. We have 39 days to election day, December 7. Yes. So we're within, within the, the... Yes, we're within the first the, the, half the, of the, it. The first half of it. Yeah. Let's see. And we'll see how the coming days will look like for the Ghana Freedom Party. Certainly. Whether they and we wish them the best of luck in the election. Very well indeed. And obviously condolences to them as they do that. But exactly. you would remember I could call for a number of things, including all the humor that she brought to our politics in this country. And... My attention was drawn to some of the promises she was making going into this election. She was going to free all the prisoners and free fuel for um, trotro drivers, you know, and all of that. That juicy promises, indeed. But let's let's hear from her. Yeah, um, well, our lady cameraman in the studio was just telling me that um, one of the promises was one year maternity leave. She's interested in that. I mean, everybody has an interest, depending on maybe you probably have been interested in something else. Yeah. But of course, I mean, she's just promising just as much as the other candidates are promising. Also promising. Yeah, so it's. Promises mm. Gallo. Indeed. There was also one quick one before we go. Yes. yes. So I was basically making the point that so in the next 10 days, they will have to find a replacement for or see they will not contest the election. And that's going to then present that yes. scenario. That, that scenario you... where the NDC is already ready for it. Hmm. But hopefully we don't get there. We'll see. Hopefully we don't get there. We'll see. We remain at your election command center and, and still staying with East elections and matters arising coming up next here on Ghana Tonight.
uh, the flag bearer of the NDC, John Dramani Mahama, has uh, been posing some questions to the flag bearer of the NPP, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. This is coming up next here on your election command center. And it's captioned some five questions essentially that he posed to him, also reminding him of the 170 questions that he, that's Dr. Baumia, posed to the late Parkwesi Emisa Atta. And all of that, the Ghana city as well, was one of the questions, and three other currencies have been reported to be the worst performing currencies in Sub Saharan Africa in 2024. This is according to the World Bank, October 2024 Africa Pulse report. Going to get to details of that right now here on your election command center. But first off, let's hear from the flag bearer of the NDC, John Mahama, who talks about the depreciation of the city, which also ties into this World Bank report that I'm going to make reference to shortly. This is what he had to say. He should go and answer the, the, the 170 questions himself. Indeed, he shouldn't answer 170 questions. He should answer only three questions. Three. Why is the exchange rate 17 cities to the dollar? Question one. Exam, he should come and write. Why has Ghana's debt risen from 120 billion to 767 billion in eight years? Question two, he should come and answer. Question three. Why is inflation where it is? Why did it rise to 54%? Uh, Question four. Why did you borrow 42 billion cities from the Bank of Ghana. Well, so those were the questions that John Mahama posed to the flag bearer of the MPP, Dr. Mahmoud Obamia. The exchange rate is one of them. And I, I asked Haruna Mohammed, who is the Deputy General Secretary of the NPP, these questions. And he says that Dr. Mahmoud Obamia would only respond to these questions if and only if John Mahama agrees to a debate with him. I spoke to him earlier on 3FM 92.7 Hot Edition, which is at 5 p.m. Take a look. John Mahama doesn't talk to our main people. Um, he, if you want to talk about me, I to respond to him. Um, he should come for the debate. Dr. I... Baumia has called him to a debate. If he has questions for Dr. Baumia, he should come for the debate. Are you Dr. saying Dr. it's Baumia... only at the debate that he will respond to why the exchange rate no, is 17 cities to the he, dollar? He, he wants to ask questions. The debate is meant to ask questions. Hasn't it been done always? At the debate forum, they ask questions. Beyond him, we have been speaking to you businessmen. How not? They want to find out how come the exchange rate is 17 cities to the dollar. What do you ex yeah, John, the explanation to that? John Dramani Mahama wants to be answered. I am asking him. He should come for the debate. We will respond. We have met business people. We have met industry. We have met the trade union. We have met civil society. And uh, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia has explained his policies what he wants to do when he becomes the president. He has... So that's the Deputy General Secretary of the MPP. He says the only answers they'll give is at the debate to these questions. But if you go on uh, visit any Forex Bureau, this is how the city is performing, the health of the city against the dollar. If you go to go and exchange the city, I mean, to, to get a dollar, you will get it at 17 cities. That's you buying from the Forex Bureau. If you have a dollar and you're going to exchange to get a city, that's 16 cities, 70 pesos. The pound has crossed the 20 city mark and the euro has crossed the 17 city mark if you are going to change your euro. But if you're buying the euros, it's selling at 18 cities, 20 pesos. And this is it. Based on the, the, the rankings from the World Bank Pulse report, the Ghana city is amongst the top four worst performing currencies. The South Sudan pound lost over 60 percent plus against the dollar the ethiopian bar lost over 50 that's value and nigeria naira also lost over 40 percent of its value against the dollar the ghana city over 24 percent since since the beginning of the year january um to this moment and um 
Let's have a, a very quick conversation with Chona Makbelo um, beyond the politics of it. He is uh, a, a member, executive member of the Association of Ghana Industries, AGI. Chona, th th this certainly m must be a, a, a big challenge for you, the depreciation of the city, correct? Unfortunately, we'll, we'll come back and, and have a quick conversation with Chona Makbelo right after this quick break. Stay with us. Well, welcome back to Ghana Tonight, also live on 3F92.7. As per the rankings on the World Bank Pulse report, uh, the Ghana City is part of the four worst performing currencies and showed you the depreciation of the city right now against the dollar. Chonam Akpelo is an executive member of the Association of Ghana Industries, AGI. Chonam, thank you for the patience and staying up to connect with us. Uh, certainly, this depreciation of the city must be impacting on you. It's a big issue, is it not? Of course, it is a big issue, Alfred. It's an extremely big issue. The, the, the continuous depreciation of the city is gradually remaining one of the biggest reasons why a lot of our businesses may just have to pull down. Look, almost most of our companies have to import raw material from abroad because the country is not designing the system to ensure that we have adequate local production of raw materials. And so we have no option than to import them. And importation means that you have to have hard currency. You have to, you know, buy dollars, as it were, to be able to buy the raw materials. And we do this in monthly, in quarterly, and sometimes weekly. And from the beginning of the year to now, can you imagine the number of money that we have to find in order just to import raw materials and to compete with products that are mostly imported. And so we're getting to a stage where it's becoming unsustainable to import raw materials. Because if you do, then you have to be able to increase the price that you sell in the market. But we're competing with other people. It's not as simple as just pushing the price to the consumer. So the, 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 the natural Ghanaian industrialist is struggling to just cope with being able to remain in business just to, to look for money, to import raw materials and, and, and produce. And if it was a situation where steps are being taken to even increase the locally sourced raw materials, would that be great? But as I speak, Poultry farmers have to import greens to feed their poultry, not because we are not producing greens in the country, but because even when we produce the greens, the beans, and all of that, people from abroad, Burkina Faso, Mali, who come and buy from the farm gate and send to Mali and only resell back to us when it is now expensive. So even the internal gains, the, the homegrown, the approaches we are we are we are using to agriculture and production and all of that. We're not making any gain from it. So government will use this money to subsidize by giving fertilizer to our farmers, by giving them subsidies, by giving them plant input and all of that for them to be able to produce, so to supply to our industries. Mm -hmm. Now after production, because it is juicy to sell to the guy from Burkina or Mali, right. the businessman. They sell all these products out of the country, yet the, the, the local industry cannot get the raw materials to produce. And this is the reality. And at the same time, the currency is free falling on a daily basis. So really, you're stuck. You are unable to continue to keep, keep the business. So how big is that? The, the realities of the currency depreciation is real. Mm. And Step must be taken. In fact, just step must be taken to really have it resolved. And rightly so. Uh, Chona Makpelo, so beyond the politics, it is the businesses that are living the reality of the depreciation of the city. Thank you so much, Chona Makpelo, an executive member of the Association of Ghana Industries, AGI. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana Tonight. And with this, I want to say thank you, as always, for staying with us here on Ghana Tonight. Join us same time tomorrow for another conversation. We're live on as well, 3FM 92.7 and uh, TV3 Ghana on Facebook and DSV Channel 279 all across the world on 3news.com. I am Alfred Okonse. Have a good night.